Hi, I'm Phil Anderson and welcome to my channel. I've been a property investor now for over 30 years and I've watched investors continue to make the same common investment mistakes. There's so many dirty tricks in the real estate industry and it's all caught up in a whole heap of sales hype. I want to cut through that sales hype and help investors avoid the common mistakes. I hope you enjoy the following content, but please remember to like and subscribe. Welcome listeners and viewers across the country. This is another episode of Street Smart Property Investing, where we're going to have a look, as always, behind the headlines. We're going to get behind the sales hype and we're going to have a look at what's really going on you know, on the ground in uh, the Australian property market. And there's a lot to talk about at the moment. There's so much energy happening in the Australian property market, which is great news for investors. But at the same time, there's a lot of scary stuff going on. And there's a different set of circumstances with regards to investing that, you know, we've never seen before. Uh, Each podcast, I'm always joined by industry experts that I know well, I trust and uh, share my passion in helping protect fellow property investors. Um, They bring different sets of skills to the table. My good friend Gordon Ruddy is one of the most known and trusted um, property strategists, you know, working one-on-one with investors on a daily basis and uh, the gentleman that's known for having such a huge heart when it comes to, you know, giving his, his, uh, his time and, and dedication to helping investors navigate that space safely and effectively. We'll have a talk to Gordy in a second. And Mr. Trent Durrington, you know, the gentleman I jokingly call the bulldog that's, uh, the you know, the guardian at the gates that... Uh, You know, his background is, you know, acquisitions really, like helping some of the biggest, um, you know, building companies and and groups of investors and, uh, you know, people understand the property market and how to, you know, to target the right subdivisions and, you know, um, how to avoid certain developers and certain issues with, you know, locations and problems and so forth. He's got such a you know, a, a specialised uh, skill set these days and pretty much, mate, like the back of your hand pretty much, you're getting such a wide scope too from Victoria down to all those markets outside of Melbourne all the way through now to North yeah, Queensland. I've got a pretty good feel for most of those markets and uh, the estates that sit within certain suburbs and the, the go zones and the not so uh, go zones, I guess. But mate, um, uh, certainly exciting time uh, at the moment really unprecedented um you know i think when we we reach out to some of these lj hookers in in these markets and we understand what the owner occupiers are doing on existing stock uh i see it on all the new stock waiting list ballot systems um and then yields issues for um renters it's a perfect storm as far as a property market and you know, it is. And, and the big topic, I guess, for today is, you know, the age-old question that investors have with regards to what do we target, capital growth or, you know, cash flow. Um, we thought that was a good topic for today because being such a unique point in the Australian property market, certainly, as we've discussed uh, over and over, it's, it's, it's a whole new set of circumstances that we haven't seen before ourselves in our you know, whatever it is, decades of experience. Um, so we need to touch on that. And, and we're also going to cross over. We're going to have a talk to a, an agent in the western suburbs of Sydney that's really in a market. He's in Penrith and he's in a market that could be seen as being part of the Sydney market, but it's proving to be anything but that. It's proving to be a satellite city and he's enjoying strong growth through COVID and post-COVID. We'll cross over to Pete in just a moment. But while we're on the topic and while we're talking, Trent, um, mate, with your hands-on experience, because you've got such a close relationship and hands-on experience with what's happening on the ground in you know some of the biggest land developers and some of the most you know known and trusted uh, building companies up and down the east coast of Australia, talk about the fact when it comes to capital growth, you know, and and obviously we'll get to the cash flow component. We're always wanting to target markets at the right time, but mate, we've got some unique things going on at the moment. Tell the listeners what you're experiencing yourself when it comes to targeting markets. Yeah, mate. Well, we've been. Uh We've, we've targeted markets for the last decade and um, for, for strong reason, population growth, infrastructure, um, tight rental uh, vacancies. Uh, but those markets now have really accelerated post-COVID uh, because of the push to the regions. Um, 
you know, specifically, um, you know, with specifically, you know, regional New South Wales and and South East Queensland, um, you know, that obviously it's, everybody's reading about it daily about the the numbers pushing out of the capitals. Uh, but what that's done is just really uh, push demand. Um, you know, the owner occupiers are on waiting lists and ballot systems to build new homes in some of these estates. Developers try to stay ahead of the curve as far as their um, construction, having enough land to deliver. So they're chasing their tail a little bit to deliver mm-hmm. land. Um, so then you've got, you know, primarily we've we've always focused on the owner-occupier estates. So when they get absorbed, um, you know, there's just no room for the investors to go into that into those markets and specifically those estates. So it's, it's really, um, I've had to really lean on some relationships and um, get allocations where normally some of those builders and developers may be able to allocate, say, 10 to 15 lots. We're only getting two. Um, but that's good. That's great for the investor. Um, the people that are really suffering are the, suffering are the renters, which is unfortunate. Uh, but as a property investor, that's why we invest. Yeah, absolutely. I think the important thing for the you know the listeners to understand is your focus. From what I understand, your focus on where is of most interest really hasn't changed to what it was prior to COVID. It may have expanded a bit. It's gone a little bit quicker and it's expanded out a little bit broader. But the reality is, the best markets pre-COVID are still the best markets today. They're just moving much quicker because of COVID. You know, they've accelerated. They they, they were really in a position to be the best performing markets at the moment. There was evidence they were going to go into a great growth period. Tell the listeners a bit about that. Well, you're spot on. It's um, those markets that we're targeting, I guess, from an investment standpoint and the benefits of, um, you know, building a new home and, um, you know, I guess the being the lazy investor where you, you you know you purchase and then forget mm-hmm. you get the best tenants you're getting great yield cash flow positive um, you know those markets are, are just harder to get into mm. but um, obviously they were performing before but again it's just all accelerated and, and potentially you know potentially we're at the last twenty percent of the cycle yeah you know um, yep. and and you know. There's still plenty of growth. We yeah. talked to we talked to all these people, even in the capitals. They're saying the capital gro- capital growth in the city, Sydney and Melbourne. You think, you know, it's getting up there. But uh, the markets we target are some fifty percent less in median house price than than some of the big capitals. So, you know, history tells us there's a lot of catch up to happen. Yeah. So a couple of things there, just helping the listeners understand what I grabbed there when you talk about the last twenty percent of a cycle. We've observed um, through, you know, I know my investment experience and Gordy and I have been mates and talking about property for over 30 years now and your background goes back decades, even when you were playing professional baseball overseas and Mm. stuff, you're always coming home, picking up the tools and buying property and doing all of that stuff. But the reality is that, um, you know, uh, what we're seeing, I guess, what we're, um, you know, in a typical cycle, most of the growth happens in you know you said 20 percent of the cycle is you know most most property cycles not much happens and then everything happens in a small portion of that cycle so many of these markets when you describe they're in that last 20 percent of a, a cycle they're really coming into the best growth phase that's right yeah yeah that's that's what i mean by that yeah. um you know and cycles have different um uh different lengths mm-hmm. you know Traditionally, Sydney's been a seven seven year cycle, mm-hmm. you know, um, seven to ten year cycle where where you're doubling that the value's doubling, um, but the problem to be in those cycle is that you you know your cash flow suffers, uh, your yield's not there, so you're chipping sure. out. You might be getting capital growth, but it's a it's a drain. Mm. Um, we've traditionally tried tried to uh, target those areas where it's either neutral or cash flow positive, um, and you get good sustained growth. Um, but it's about to run. Yeah, and, and that yeah. brings us back to the core topic. You know, the, the that type of investor that's happy to put up with that, you know, that cash flow drain because they're chasing cash uh, capital growth. Um, you know, that's always made that barbecue conversation. Well, are you chasing capital growth, which is that city 
blue chip investor or are you chasing cash flow which some people think only happens in the mining towns where the risk goes through the roof. But we know, and you obviously specialise in understanding well, what market's going to bring a very good balance of both, good solid capital growth as well as good cash flow. Yeah, yeah, and, th- and that's just understanding um, a lot of it's around the government stimulus and uh, at the federal and state level as far as what the infrastructure is coming, mm-hmm. uh, which is creates jobs, Um bit of street smart property investing, I guess, and, uh, you know, you've heard me touch on I, I guess I take it for granted. It's not rocket science, but uh, I guess when you're in that space daily, uh, having multiple conversations about what's going on, uh, talking to councils, talking to developers, you get an understanding, well, you know, you, know, you can look at a three-, five-year- and ten-year uh, forecast and go, shit, this is going to be a good area. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, Matt, I think that thing when you say it's not rocket science, I think a big part of that is just how familiar you are with what knowing what to look for. A lot of people, they just don't know what to look for. Also, one of the things that you've developed is a team. You've got a great team. So when you're looking for information about any element that you need to put the ingredients together to make a good choice, you've got that great team around you. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people are trying to do this on your own, which is ridiculous in the market today. You need a team around you. Yeah, you certainly do, uh, and it's trying to understand, you know, catering that uh, boutique or bespoke property for what the renters are can, you know, that medium price they're chasing in that market, and and what do they need in that house? You know, yeah. you know, what is it they're looking for? Yeah, how much, how big a yard do they want? You know, or how many bedrooms? You know, there's obviously now work from home, so we're talking builders about making sure houses have the ability for a bedroom to be set up as an office, all those types of things. Yeah. Um, and that changes market to market, cycle to cycle, stage to stage. Yeah. You mentioned grants and so forth, and they're just the moving dynamics, and there's always some moving dynamics that sits on top of a proven recipe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Mate, just that's so interesting yeah. from your side. Let's talk about the investor experience. Let's cross over to Mr Gordon Ruddy. How are you, Gordy? Doing great. You're doing Excited great? to be here. Good on you, mate. It's always great to see you. So let's talk a little bit about that investor experience. Now, we're talking about capital growth versus, you know, cash flow. Um, you know, what, how do investors approach that these days? What are their expectations and what are you seeing in that investor experience? Well, what I'm seeing is, and I think we've always seen it, with the, with the properties that, um, you know, Trent targets, we really don't have to make a choice. You know, we've always had the, you know, the, the, you know, the pleasure, I guess, of, of being in markets that provide both of those. Uh, at the moment, though, it's, it's, it's a little bit unfair because when I say unfair, it's like it's too good. Mm. And um, it's never been more affordable for, um, for investors to get into the market. Interest rates at the, at the levels they're at and the yields that we're getting at the moment, it's it's incredible. Mm. It r- really is. It's um, you know, it's it's the best I've ever seen. The best I've ever seen it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, we've always you know, we've always believed property offer offers you know, one of the best, if not the best, opportunities to leverage, because you know, it, it's hard to find somebody that doesn't have some core belief in property mm-hmm. and have, has seen property over the years go up and not not with volatility. You know, in most markets, it's just, you know, from decade to decade, you look back and you go, man, property's gone up. The banks love it. You know, mm-hmm. there's they, they don't have issues with, um, you know, lending ridiculous LVRs against them, mm-hmm. which makes it great for us. And, you know, we, we, we've often spoken about it and said, well... You know, what, what does leverage really mean? And leverage is doing a lot with very little. Mm. And that's what we can do out of property for very little of our money. We're actually, with none of our money, with 100% of the bank's money, we can, we can buy property. Yeah. It's crazy. A couple crazy. of little things I picked up on then. One of the things that you mentioned was Australia's love for property and how resilient it's proved to be. It's interesting that we've faced some pretty big crisis in the past. You know, we've been through the GFC and we know that well as investors. We've been through now one of the most unprecedented events that had all of us puzzled to know what would happen. 
at the backbone of the Australian property market, I think one of the things that is not that well understood is that the Australian government decided many years ago they don't want to supply housing in Australia. They want private investors to supply housing in Australia. Huge portion of our wealth is tied up in housing in Australia. The government sees the need to support that. The government was tested through the, you know, the COVID period and we saw many things that they did and the actions they took to make sure that the property market was somewhat protected and obviously the combination of Australia's passion for property, uh, our low supply levels of property, that's one of the things, we're not oversupplied like we've seen in many other countries around the world, um, and the reality of uh, little things that the government still has plenty of uh, options to, to cards they can play to support the property market, resulted in you know us coming through COVID pretty much unscathed, right? So... Uh, you know, in association with how stable that can be and how much the government wants to keep it stable, I think now we've got new levels of confidence from investors. The banks also play right into that by looking at residential property. And when you compare it to any other property class uh, and many other investment any other choices, any other asset class, they're happy to give residential homes the highest level of support because they see it as safe. That's how they see it, right? So whilst we look at it and go, man, it's crazy that they'll let people borrow most of the money, it's because the banks see it as a safe investment, right? So now all of those layers are certainly, you know, kind of helping people come out of COVID more confident than they went into it, which is why I guess now we're seeing a combination of investors go, geez, this is the best window we've ever seen to invest. You know, we've never seen a time where... We can actually buy properties and be better off. Mm. You know, normally there's some pain to investing, but at the moment when you buy a property, you actually end up more comfortable than you were before it. Yeah, people can buy an investment property today and use the return on that investment property to re- re- reduce the debt in other areas of their life. Uh, Plus, give them the opportunity for the capital growth on that property. So it's just a it's a win-win-win. You can't... you <laughs> it's. It's pretty difficult to lose. And, mate, it's exciting. I hear you talking about mm. working with clients that are buying a property, having, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a week, positive cash flow, mm. borrowing, a, you know, effectively 100% of the mm. cost of the of the property, cash flow positive, using that money to pay down their, their mortgage. It's, it's you know, saving 10 years off their home mortgage using the investment property they just purchased. Mm. Yeah, anyway, and, you know, over that time, a couple of hundred thousand dollars in interest. It's yeah. bizarre. You, you, yeah, you and, compound and that with the capital growth they make, and it, it's hard. To, you, you, it's hard to calculate the the percentage gain on what you put in because you don't put anything in. How do, yeah. how do you calculate? Yeah, it? We've yeah. done it before, and it's just you try to do it in in a system, and it just gives you question marks. Because how do they calculate? You know, making a hundred thousand dollars on zero. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, it is. And yeah. if people think about ten percent growth in the property market, they go, okay, well, it's gone from five hundred to five hundred and fifty. But investors that really, you know, understand how to invest, they might not have put any money in. So, you know, it's hard actually, to calculate. They, they actually did less than put money in. They got money back <laughs> and still made money. Yeah, so the, the, the return on investment mm. is, is crazy and that'll do your head mm. in if you try to figure that but one it, out. But, well, even <laughs> and, and beyond that, like I said when I started, that we've always saw property as a great leverage tool to borrow against, but... We're seeing investors now that have been, you know, they, they might be older and they're, they, they're sitting on some cash and the cash is earning them nothing. So even just using cash with the return they get, if you can get 6 to 7% on a property by buying it for cash, that still compounds because they're getting the capital growth plus they're getting the rent return. It's just, mm. it's... It's bizarre at the moment. It, yeah, really it is. is. And now yeah. we're seeing a lot more of that. You're mm, talking about a lady yeah. this morning that goes, hey, I'm sitting on this money. Why would I leave it sitting in a bank account? Mm. Even if it was at our minimum level of return, it's still far, far better mm. than you know what they're getting in the banks. But Absolutely. N- you know, when you mention 6 or 7% returns, there'd be investors out there going, you can't get that on residential property. Well, you can. You mm. can when you know what to buy, where to buy. It's just unfortunate that most investors in the past have been getting maybe a third of that, mm. you know, in, in Sydney and Melbourne and uh, by targeting the wrong properties like, you know, apartments with high-body corporate fees and, and different problems. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, let's not go into apartments. Obviously, that's the only <laughs> bloodbath that's in Australia, mm. in the Australian market. It's, uh, you know, the Sydney-Melbourne 
uh, apartment market. Some it's it's just a, a part of the um, industry or, or property that we've never could understand. Well, it's always a higher believe. risk market yeah. anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah. but also from a return. Um, you know, we've always been about the land component and and. Uh, Anyway, let's well, thank not goodness. Talk, let's that's not, what I yeah. say. Thank yeah. goodness we yeah. got that message, and yeah. we we stuck yeah. to that because yeah. that's proven to be a game changer amongst investors. The investors that have taken the apartment market path, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, well, just on that, I, you know, I, I Miles will talk about it a little bit because, you know, our investors that are buying in house and land are it's, it's if there's a safety uh, thought from an investor of well, I just feel better in, a, in an apartment and. You know, there's no lawns to cut, or you know, it's got a body corporate and things like that. You know, the the house and land opportunities that we chase are, are turnkey and equally as secure as, as buying an apartment, as far as those feudal tangibles. You know, property the the warranties from you get with the construction, uh, the maintenance warranties, the rental guarantees, uh, the quality of tenants uh, pushing into those areas, um, and you're getting solid land component you know, of that investment, hmm. you know. Um, so I've never really understood the the idea that apartments are safer to invest in than um, house and land. Sometimes that safety element I've heard talked about with regards to how safe a tenant feels being in, a, in an apartment building, whereas now what we're learning is the ratio of investors, uh, sorry, of, uh, you know, of renters in them as opposed to ho- homeowners you know, there can be a lot less safety because of a whole range of factors. And now what we're seeing by targeting the right estates and knowing how to get a much higher portion of owner occupiers in the states, being we're seeing people that were once uh, apartment renters that are now targeting part of a dual income property or whatever it may be in a homeowner estate because they now realise that the safety comes from being around other homeowners and a little sense of community that comes in those environments. So there's so many parts of that conversation, but every time, you know, the house and land model comes out way on top. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, and even from a uh, tax perspective, you know, as far as depreciation, I, I mean, it's just tick, 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 but... Um, I don't want to sit here and, and talk down apartments. It's not the right thing. Well, it is the right thing. Well, yeah. we're doing the right thing by yeah. investors because yeah. it should be a market they're very concerned of. There will yeah. be investors that will be sitting there going, well, actually, we like the idea of buying apartments now because the gap's gotten so big, apartments have got to be good buying. And I just kind of go, don't try and call where the bottom of that market is. There might mm. be two years left in fall of that apartment market. We don't know. You don't know. And then we don't know how long it's going to be until it turns around then you don't know how many other apartments could be built in that same suburb over the next 10 years that just keep holding down the, the, the uplift and you don't know how long you're going to have to sit there servicing alone and not be able to get a tenant. So yeah. it's just so many parts of that. Yeah. So I'm not uncomfortable warning investors that this isn't the time to think you're going to pick up a cheap apartment and be a, a superstar because of it. It's a risky strategy. It I, is. I truly yeah. think it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, let's cross over to one of my favourite principles across the nation, a gentleman I've got to know uh, on a personal level, I I, I think of this gentleman as a friend, but I also know that he's a great person for me to go to for information on that Western, that strong Western element in Sydney. Uh, Let's bring into uh, the podcast today a live cross with Mr. Peter Stanford out in Penrith. How are you, Pete? Phil, how are you? Mate, it's Always great to have you here with us, mate. Gordy and Trent and I were just talking about the fact that, uh, you know, amongst all of the principals, you're one of those gentlemen that we love to have an association with. You've got those old school values and it shines through out there in your, you know, amazing kind of uh, representation of that LJ Hooker brand out in that Penrith region. I hear the communities, you know, obviously thinks of you guys as being the market leaders in that sector. So congratulations, I mate, on building such a great, strong office out in the Penrith region. Big improvements, and I mean, um, COVID, whilst well, everybody expected COVID to be an issue, it really hasn't been for us. We've, um, we've seen remarkable growth in the last 12 months, and even starting this year, um, January, February have been just very hot markets um, in both sales and property management, so um, it's all hands on deck. We've actually put two new salespeople on two weeks ago. 
Um, so we've grown that side of the business already this year. Um, and we're looking to put a couple of property managers um, in as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's looking really good. I think we'll need to be the I, I, man, I think it, like right from the start when we talked about COVID when you and I were, you know, I think it was actually before COVID that you were planning so many changes then COVID came in and I just remember other, you know, uh, officers that kind of took their foot off the pedal. What does all this mean? How are we going to react? But you kept the pedal down, mate. You were always building, always thinking, always moving forward even through COVID which... It doesn't surprise me that you've come through that period as, you know, someone who's actually strengthened their business, not kind of just tried to hang on to it. You've come out of it stronger than you went into it. So it's a real credit to you. Team, great support. I mean, you can't do it on your own. Um, and anyone that says they can are kidding themselves. Um, we've got a team of 14 at the moment um, and everyone's contributed. So, I mean, it's been a team effort. Um and that's where we are. That's why we're where we are today. Uh, no other reason. Yeah, good on you, mate. But all good leaders give the credit to their team, so that doesn't surprise me you'd do that as well. Um, mate, tell us a little bit about what's happening on the ground. Now, we, I think the biggest, you know, uh, I think uh, lack of understanding that an investor could have of your particular part of the market is it, sometimes, we, uh, you know, investors think of Penrith as being part of, the Sydney conversation, right? And for me, I see it quite differently. I see it as a, a city of its own in the western suburbs of Sydney. It just has that, you know, greater Sydney, obviously, uh, footprint. But the reality of it is, uh, you know, for the Penrith market, while in a city, you know, Sydney may be suffering vacancy rates and there's some issues with oversupply and so forth, that's far from the story that I'm seeing out in your region. How is it feeling on the ground, mate? How are the sales and, and, and buyer demand looking in, in your region? Great question. Um, first up with sales, we increased our sales volume in the office by 38% last year uh, from the year before um, on a reduced number of properties on market um, across the, the district. So whilst we did a 38% increase, um, we took a lot more market share than we previously had, which was fantastic. Um, this year, um, we had a very good January, um, most certainly met targets reasonably comfortably. This month, February, um, we met monthly targets on the 14th of the month. So um, not a lot of sales volume in terms of properties on the market for sale. Um, what we have, we're selling quite quickly for really good prices. Um, but still, there's a lot of buyers out there and it's, it's much easier to work when you've got lots of buyers wanting um, a small number of properties. Um, the trick is getting the oh. property still in the first place. Yeah, It's almost like uh, the energy uh, is not just really seen the regional markets do incredibly well, but as that ripple has rolled out of Sydney, it's almost like they've seen Penrith as this, you know, uh, another satellite city that they can go into and they've got space around them and they've got all the facilities they need, uh, backyards and <laughs> some of the things that the inner city uh, properties lack. Um, so you've really benefited and you've positioned yourself. It's a pretty competitive market out there. There's a, there's a few offices in your region, but you've, mate, you've really worked hard to take a big market share in that region and, and certainly that's going to pay dividends. Even if the listings are down, um, you know, the combination of all those factors, it's, you know, you've obviously had a, a testimony to you that you've had such a great year. We against 30 plus uh, real estate businesses in the Penrith, greater Penrith area, and that's not including St Mary's and, and further east. Um, so there is a lot of competition out there. A lot of, a lot of things happen that really isn't in the industry's best interest, but, you know, you have to deal with those things and keep true to your own values. Um, but the team itself, I mean, the guys are all out there working hard. They're creating great relationships. We've introduced um, a very good new system that's helping us manage our database, which is 25,000 strong these days. Um, but we're cleaning that up through a, a process which um, has already paying dividends. Um, but it's just all those little things that we do a little bit differently, a little bit better, getting some great information and assistance from the professionals that know how to do it best. Um, and we're just moving forward with it. And that's all you can do 
um, if you want to move forward in, in this business. Yeah, mate, I think the mistake that, you know, the old dogs can make, mate, you've been around for a long time and, and uh, you know, you could you could sit back and let your reputation do all the work, but you've always stayed hungry, you've always tried to stay ahead of the, you know, the market, you've always tried to stay up with the, uh, you know, the technology and the systems and so forth. And uh, like I said, there's some, some you know, some mm. quality uh, offices around Australia that have maybe let go of their market share and their market position because they haven't kept up with some of those elements. So it, it is really important and it's always impressed me that you've made the effort to do so, you know. You haven't needed to, mate. You could be bloody retired comfortably. I know I know enough about you to know that you choose to work. You don't have to work. You love what you do and it shines through. Change. I mean, I'm seeing a personal trainer three days a week now and um, at my ripe old age, and I'm not going to tell you what that is, um, I didn't think I'd do that sort of stuff anymore, but I'm feeling a lot better um, physically, mentally. So, um, you know, business is about balance. Life's about balance. And if you get those balances right, it does make it a lot easier. Um, you've just got to be smart about it. I mean, I'm an no, old... You look, mate, you, you definitely look great for 46. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 20 and a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're looking great, buddy. You're looking great. I know the boys have got some questions. I know yeah. Trent, 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 you know. Yeah, Pete... Um... I've got uh, some access to the Greenfield new housing estates in, in Western Sydney. Uh, specific one of my favourites is in North North Richmond. But um, the issue being made is that, um, you know, waiting list ballot system for stage releases and, and registration not being for 18 months to two years, um, which for an investor to go into is, is taking on some risk. But uh, you've got a feel for uh, the housing, the Greenfield housing estates and just how high the demand is? Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's an interesting situation at the moment where there is delay in getting land registered and released for, um, so that people can move forward with their construction. But what I'd be saying, if they can you know, secure good property in good location and can build on it, um, I've done the same with one of the, um, the developments out at uh, Port Macquarie through, through Phil. Um, and it's worth the wait. I mean, we're in such a strong position now where we've made money before we even put a tenant in. Um, I think construction starting fill in the next week or two. All right. Um, it is, mate. That's so a great think, story. Yeah. It is a great story. Yeah. Uh, you, mate, you've, you know, obviously that's a project that you and I have been working with Gordy on for months now. And Port Macquarie is a fantastic story. Um, and that particular property and that particular example is one where you've made money before you even, you know, the first brick gets put in place, you know. So it's a great story. As Richmond's concerned, I mean, it's a really popular spot in outer Western Sydney. Um, it's, you know, not far from the rear end. You've got, you know, Windsor in that same general area. Um, and it's quite a, it's a really lovely area. Um, and I think as we find that there's, there's so much pressure on the rental accommodation in the, the greater Penrith and Hawkesbury areas, um, rents are going to go up. People are going to get good returns on, on their investments. And they're going to do well. Um, I know with us at the moment, we've got under 2% vacancy factor and we've been consistently below that for the last probably three or four years. Um, and rents, even though COVID hit and people were struggling, rents have gone up. People are working more from home. Yeah. Um, and there's such a high demand. And I can give you a classic example. We sold um, an existing home a few months back. Um, we picked it up as a rental. Um, we had 200 inquiries in the first week from real estate, wow. which was phenomenal. Had 54 people attend the open home, 14 applications and rented it for above what the owner's expectation was. And that's just one example that I could probably name 20. Um, so the demand for, for rental, good rental accommodation is is really high. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's that um, that factor on you giving advice, I guess, to uh, landlords now as far as new leases or renewing leases and how far do you push with uh, the increases and uh, trying to find the right balance. But it's... Um, you know, we spoke about it this morning, Phil. It's, it's uh, unfortunately, it's an unfortunate situation for the renters. Um, you're going to continue to get caught in in tough spots. Yeah, um, I can just see leases expiring and then having the realization that rents are going up. For some people, that's going to be, 
doable for others is going to push the boundaries, but that's just what we're seeing, Pete. You know, that's just what the... I mean, I, when I got into real estate back in 1990, so I've been around for a little while, um, rents, I mean, you could rent a unit in Penrith for, for you know, 50 bucks a week sort of thing. Um, those same units now are renting for nearly 300 a week. So, I mean, rents do progress, but property values progress and um, they're going to keep pace with each other. And we've gone from getting 7.5% return um, way back then. If you get a return of 4.4, 4.5, you're doing extremely well. A lot of them. Yeah. Are yeah. Um, it's just Mate, talk a little bit about the, you know, the, you know, when it comes down to, um, you know, a property that's listed, uh, you know, a, a, a property that's available for rent. Is it basically the same situation where there's just not enough properties to match the demand? Whether they're, you know, we, you know, there's more buyers than than, than listings, and there's more renters than, um, you know, kind of properties available for rent. Is this just the new norm? How do you think we're going to solve this problem? Is that what you're seeing out there? Two very different rental markets out there at the moment. Um, the, the rental market surrounding freestanding houses, um, the newer stuff or homes that are in really good shape are in super high demand. The older style apartments um, and even some of the high rise stuff is much harder to, to, to lease yeah. out because people are wanting that. I won't talk about the old quarter acre, which used to be the Aussie dream because there's very few. It doesn't few happen anymore, right? <laughs> On a sort of five, 450 and yeah. a 300 square metre block are much happier. And those rental properties are attracting four, five, six times as many people to the yeah. open. And the same with the applications, four, five, six times as many applications. So landlords have got a, in a really strong position and they've got so much choice. Um, and if they at least listen to good advice, they get good tenants in there. Um, and yeah. it's about good tenancy with with the property so that the landlord has a stress-free um, experience on more long-term leases. And I mean, we've got tenants who've been around for, for as long as I've been in real estate nearly. Um, mm -hmm. We've got other properties that because they're not maintained, they're old and shabby, uh, tenants tend to move out of them fairly regularly. Um, so if anyone's looking to, to, you know, to get into the investment market, um, I think new or something that's been really well maintained in a good spot is really the way to go. Yeah, mate. Look, there's so many things, Gordy and I, and as you know, Gordon and I have been helping some of your database understand, you know, kind of, um, you know, what are the better investment opportunities nationally. It's, it's um, you know, one of the things that's drawn us together and obviously our relationship with you is our common um, bond around wanting to protect investors and, and help them make better decisions and not make all the same usual classic mistakes that we've seen them make over the years. And it's a, it's a great credit to you that you don't just serve your local community, you're trying to serve your local community when they're buying outside of that community, right? Um, and we've seen this trend, Pete, over the years, and you're a great example of it, doing your latest property in, in Port Macquarie, um, you know, the reality of the way the government's got it all set up now with the best benefits around buying property and so forth, it does lean very much towards the brand new property is the only way to maximise the best parts of the negative gearing laws. But it also comes down to the investor experience. You know, you, you've got a new property, you've got builder's warranties, you've got, uh, you know, you're at the top of the list of what the, the, the renters want to rent. Um, there's just tick, 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 but we're having real troubles with regards to getting hold of land supply. You know, that's that's the big the big challenge, right? So, mate, it's an interesting time in the market, but, um, you know, you reinforce over and over the fact that, you know, these satellite cities, these communities uh, like Penrith and other regional uh, hubs and so forth certainly have come out of COVID, you know, not just unscathed but come out stronger. If you compare us to say, and I hate doing it, but and I feel sorry for the, the people that are working in those areas, but around Bondi and those areas, the eastern suburbs, uh, the rental market really fell into a decline. Um, a lot of tenants were under massive financial stress because of hospitality industry that they worked in. They struggled badly. Vacancy rates have been high. Um, we're out here, um, very different set of circumstances. Um, so it's really important to choose. They get great capital growth, yes, um, but when something goes 
pear-shaped and this pandemic most certainly made things go pear-shaped, um, they mm -hmm. were under the pump. Um, and I think when you're in a, a regional area, and whilst Penrith is a city, we're still regional Sydney, if that's the mm -hmm. best I can, I can give to Penrith. We are regional city, uh, Sydney. Um, they're good places because there's growth, there's business opportunity, there's employment opportunity, um, and there's a bit of space. Um, so that is lifestyle. People see it as lifestyle, Pete. They see that they're not going to get stuck in huge com commutes. They're not going to be necessarily paying unaffordable prices for everything from parking to rent to buying a house or whatever those things may be. Um, yeah, so I think the, 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 the message, I guess, for investors would be the fact that there's just not one story for the Australian property market. There's, you know, there's a big difference between apartments and houses, a big difference between one postcode and another postcode, uh, and you certainly need to you know, be prepared to peel away the layers to find what the real story is as opposed to just watching the headlines, right? Good out here. I mean, believe it or not, we have free unmetered parking in Penrith, would you believe? Um, wow. I can't say that about, you know, so many other suburbs in, in Sydney. Um, I park in a secure parking station every day. It costs me 80 bucks a, a month. So, I mean, 20 bucks a week for secure uh, undercover parking. You just can't beat it. Um, oh, mate. In Brisbane City, you'd go into there and pay... $80 for three hours yeah. or something yeah. stupid, you know what I mean? It is crazy what I see in some of the cities. So, I mean, um, we've, we've got it good um, and the lifestyle is good. We're getting great restaurants out here. We've got a new restaurant precinct that's opened up down on the river. Um, there's a lot of things happening um, and it makes the district really hum. We've got new restaurants opening straight out of COVID, um, which is great. And we didn't see too many businesses uh, close, which was also really good. Um, and I think regional areas um, don't suffer the same way that, you know, the CBDs and those inner areas do suffer. Yeah, no, mate, look, it's always great to talk to you, Peter. I really do appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man, uh, but it's great to get an update on the market. We're looking forward to giving, you know, quarterly updates. We're going to be doing, obviously, an online quarterly update for your database and letting them know what's going on, you know, throughout the Australian property market. I, I just uh, really do appreciate the fact that you, you know, share our passion for protecting investors and helping them make better decisions, mate. Happy to do so. Yeah, good on you. Well, we'll definitely check in on you from time to time. I appreciate your time today. Uh, take care, buddy, and we'll talk again soon, hey? Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. It's always talk great to cross over, as you know, we know to some of those guys, those key guys that give us an insight as to what ha what's happening in those, you know, those pockets, those city centres, really, that are much stronger than people give them credit for. One of the interesting things that Pete mentioned was the difference between a new house and the older stock, the older apartment buildings and so forth. It's interesting in such a tight rental market that we're hearing that over and over that if anything's vacant, it's apartments, even in the areas that have got no, mm. no properties. So, you know, I mean, yeah. you worry about some of those areas, as we mentioned earlier, yeah. where there's an oversupply of apartments and we're seeing vacancy rates at alarming levels. It's mm. just, I think with COVID, everyone's looking for space. Everyone wants a house. They want the backyard. It just yeah. has heightened that. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's, it's old houses as well. I mean, uh, I think Pete was referring to that as well, that, uh, you know, the, the renter wants new over old. Mm -hmm. um, and, and typically that's where the yield, high yielding property is with the new properties, you know. So um, there's and, something in that. And mate, there's something really in it because I know as investors – uh, you know, I, I'm so keen to get into the market at the moment. I'm talking to so many people each week and they're targeting existing stock. They're now up against so many people that are trying to buy into those markets because they're able to take their jobs to these new locations thanks to remote working, et cetera, et cetera. There's a heightened amount of uh, buyer demand. So they're now competing. They're now paying emotional prices for a for a uh, existing property, mm. often going well above what the owner hoped to achieve in these you know, sexy lifestyle uh, regional markets. So they could either get sucked into that, and I'm hearing people kind of trying to justify that, plus they're buying properties that the government decided in 2019 don't really get that many great negative gearing benefits. So they, they're not that great as an investment property to target on paper. 
And it only gets worse when the investor buys them and starts thinking, hmm, the, the bathroom could do with a bit of a makeover and we should put some new carpet down and paint the walls and all of those little layers. I think the comparison really does go... There's just no um, you know, real comparison between buying an existing property and buying a new property in the market today because of all of those factors. You, you're seeing that on paper, Gordy, when it comes to the investor experience? Absolutely. And, you know, my... Biggest takeaway from today's podcast is with the, you know, the properties that that Trent researches and finds and gets together for us is exactly that, is that we're just getting the best benefits out of it, and investors can come in, and without it being, man, I'm I'm making an investment to, you know, to help with my future. It's like I'm making investments that help me today. Mm. That's the thing that's happening. Someone's investing today. And it's changing their life today. They don't have to wait 10 years to improve their lifestyle. That one investment today makes them a better life. Today. Today. And that, exactly. that's yeah. a really interesting thing mm-hmm. to really bring it back to because we are seeing that. We're seeing mm. people that are better off by buying a property today. And typically, you know, we would have bought a property to help us with our retirement 15, 20 years down Which the Which you're still going to do, but it's it's helping us today. From day one, it's helping us. Yeah, Put look money at, in our pocket from day yeah. one. And for me, I think the thing that's resonated for me is the fact that, uh, you know, it's tough out there. It's tough mm. out there for investors to get into these markets. Stock levels are so low. And, and having that conversation even before we jumped on, on air um, about – the line of people that you're seeing build up, the amount of investors that now realise they've gone out, they've tested the markets. If they truly want to get into the premium markets, they're finding themselves locked out. They just can't get in. So they're now forming a line and saying, Trent, I'm in line here. Help me out. But I'm next on the list. Yeah, I've probably, as of today, got uh, 15 people, um, investor clients that have um, put their hand up. You're trying to source land, do Yeah, yeah. Trent, Phil, you know... um, if you can get your finger on one of these lots, we'll take it, you know. Um, which, you know, traditionally hasn't been that way. Um, we, we think about last week's podcast and uh, Shane mentioning that, uh, you know, he hasn't seen this in 20 years since the 01 yeah. boom. And yeah. uh, I think that's... I, I, I take some from that and go, you know, this is an unprecedented time. It's an exciting time. Um, and, and touching on what good is, it's... it's uh, a, it's a, also a bit of an emotional um, purchase in, in purchasing these investment properties because you're going into markets that uh, the investors can also see themselves potentially retiring. Absolutely. More know. of that than I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, all in all, it's, it's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And I think what, you know, the, the apprenticeship that we've done for 20, 30 years or something is now paying off because of the fact that market conditions are so hard. It is very much about relationships. If you haven't got those relationships... Man, it's going to be tough to buy. You'd have to go to a, you know, a not so hot market or potentially a market that isn't really getting drawn into the benefits of these market conditions. And probably, if you're an investor out there going, ah, you know, I can do this on my own. Probably, it's most likely you're just not really in the best of the hot markets. Yeah, yeah. But you know that the push is on. Obviously, markets heat up and people have to look outward. Yeah, um, so that's sure. ha- that's happening. Oh, new hotspots will yeah. emerge because of this for sure. Yeah, you know, so um, that's happening, which is creating uh, more opportunity, exciting opportunity. Councils are going to have to um, forward their growth strategies, open up um, zonings, uh, which they're quickly looking at. Uh, so there'll be new opportunities coming, and and um, in Australia, I guess uh, with population growth and touching on just touching on that and. Uh, looking at the ABS reports and, you know, however many decades, they've been pretty spot on with their forecasting, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, and that's another big thing that we look at is to look at the supply and demand needed in the in the short to medium term, uh, in long term, and, and um, just another guarantee of finding the right uh, tenants. Yeah, yeah. And there's a problem because... You know, all data, when you break it down, unfortunately those news headlines can focus on an oversupply area and talk about the fact that there's an oversupply issue. We know, uh, you know, the vast majority of markets at the moment that are really where investors should be placing their investment choices over this, uh, what I think is the best ever window that I've seen to invest, you know, in my 30 years of experience, 
are in markets where it's a drastic undersupply and I don't know how they're going to keep up, which means there's going to be upward pressure on both the capital growth and the income. This is, it's unique. It's, a, it's not just what we look for. It's, you know, it's a market that's just accelerated and uh, much more powerful than we could have ever hoped for. You know, I guess in closing comments, guys, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. We're going to dig into some great topics over the coming podcasts. But I think your message would be get on the list. Yeah. <laughs> get in line, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> get yeah. in line. Yeah. And for Gordy, yeah. I think the big thing you would say to your clients is get ready. test the numbers and get ready. Because I think most people would be very surprised what those numbers look like, how comfortable it could be, the fact that their lifestyles could be easier because they buy. Um, but... It's not going to happen easy. You're going to need to get your little team around you. You're going to need to have a plan and get finance tested and have those elements together. It's what we call become buyer ready. Um, But it's worth the effort, guys. I think this is an amazing window we're looking at. Thanks for joining me today, guys. Good on you, Phil. Good on you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks 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 for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and also feel free to leave me a question. I look forward to helping as many property investors as possible. Take care and we'll talk soon.